Welcome to Coming In Hot. Thank you live from Airplay Beats for the intro music. We are recording live from Darling New Media Studios in Midtown Sac. All right, everybody. I think we got the biggest guest that we've had on Coming In Hot with Chef Cease. When you talk about Sacramento and the movements of Sacramento, food trucks were around in Sacramento. We actually started getting gourmet food trucks in Sacramento at the beginning of the 2010s. But this man took that movement and took it to the next level of where Sacramento can be. If you don't know who I'm talking about, we are talking about the owner of Sacto Mofo. Paul Summerhouse is in the building. What up, Paul? Damn, I need to hire you as my personal introduction manager. <laughs> hey, just, just anywhere you go, I'll be right with you. Just right behind you, hyping me up. I'm going to be popular everywhere I go. This is awesome. <laughs> hey, Paul, so one question that I've always wanted to ask, and we've had so many conversations. Where are you from, Paul? I'm actually, I, nobody would ever guess based on my appearance, but I was born and raised in Spain, so I'm, I'm Spanish. Okay. But I lived there for about 15, 16 years, and then I moved to Holland for a few years. Okay. Didn't really enjoy the cold and the rain and the darkness there, and so I'm, then I moved to the United States in my early 20s, and I've been here since. So when you came from Spain, well, you came from Holland... Was Sacramento your first destination or did you, you know, hit New York, you know, East Coast, travel around and then found a home here? How did you, so from Holland, how did you get to Sacramento? So as long as we can keep this between you and I, I don't usually share this secret, but. Um, Nobody listens to this podcast. <laughs> I, uh, I came uh, to Miami because I saw too many episodes of Miami Vice. All right. I, I was like, I want to go live where, where there's alligators on boats and, and <laughs> everybody drives Ferraris. That's that's where I want to go. But then I realized that you actually have to make a living to, yeah. you know, live that lifestyle and, and have a little bit of money. Yes. Being a server and a bartender in Miami doesn't really pay those bills. So <laughs> um, I uh, another thing I, was, I thought was overrated was their humidity. That's that's just a little outrageous out there. Yeah. And finally, the size of their creatures, like the, the spiders, the size of your fist and and, and they're everywhere. It just, it was, it was, I, I liked it in a lot of ways. It's a beautiful city. It's a beautiful, South Florida is gorgeous, mm -hmm. but um, to live long-term, it wasn't a good fit for me. And somebody mentioned Lake Tahoe mm -hmm. and um, I'd never heard of it. I looked it up. It looked cool. And they said there were tons of jobs. So I basically packed my one bag of clothes that I owned and I had a 1987 Hyundai Accord <laughs> and uh, no Hyundai. Um, uh, what was it? A uh, Hyundai, Accent. whatever. An accident, yeah. One of those old, like, crappy cars with like scotch tape and tree hanger, uh, clothes hangers, uh -huh. pulling it together. And I drove from Miami through to all the way here, and and uh, I lived, I lived and worked in Lake Tahoe for five years, mm -hmm. and eventually I started taking care of high rollers. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those high rollers was married to a woman who was high up in government here, and she okay. grew fond of me and said, you know, I'm I'm gonna find you a job and lo and behold a year later she called me and said i need your resume well you know when you live in work and food and beverage you don't really have or need a resume so i didn't have one <laughs> and so she wrote it for me okay and uh, got me an interview and then i spent 15 years working in government what what is she what was the you know the attraction to you for this woman just to take this like into you and be like hey you know let, let's get you into government and were you ready to go in the government? Because government's a whole different beast from That's a the good food question. and alcohol. <laughs> yeah, I had no business being in government, but I, uh, I've, I call them angels. There's a probably about six to eight people in my life. I, I suspect you probably had those same people that at some point um, in in your life, particularly, you know, I grew up kind of a rough upbringing, and I left left home at fifteen and. Um, from that moment on, I kind of relied on outside guidance from, from strangers, essentially. And sometimes you get to those crossroads and you can go the right way or the wrong way. And 
I uh, probably did about 60% the right way. Uh, that's why I, I kept away from felonies, you know, try to <laughs> make sure you know, the whole handcuff thing is overrated. <laughs> but most of the time I made the right decisions. And, and along those paths, there were these people that pushed me in those directions for mm -hmm. no real reason. Like there, there, there was, there was no, I've never really fully understood why this woman helped me the way she did, because yeah. not only did she find me an interview, I didn't realize that I already had the job before I interviewed. She was influential enough in where I work mm -hmm. that once she said you were working there, you, my job was already done, but I didn't know how to type. I didn't know how to do a letter. I didn't know how to write government stuff, but yeah. I've always been a fast learner. I've been very resilient most of my life. And within a short amount of time, I adjusted and learned and I found it politics is intriguing it's it's like the kardashians but in real life and real consequences <laughs> and it's just there's drama and action and craziness every day and it's yeah. very intoxicating and um i really enjoyed the the time and then eventually after about 10 years of doing sort of administrative international relations type work i shifted over to international trade mm. and that it was what much more my up my alley i really enjoyed um, my area of spe specialization was uh, u.s mexico trade mm -hmm. and uh, facilitating that despite all the vitriol that exists there the, uh, Mexico is our, our uh, number one trading partner and, and we're very much interdependent on each other mm -hmm. so I got to learn a lot about the interactions between Mexico and the United States and also econ ec economy of scale at the macro level and how mm -hmm. every small action has a big consequence when you you know make it more difficult to cross the border it yeah. impacts trade when you open the borders it impacts trade how do you how do you manage all those things how the environment is affected when two countries that live side by side. It's just, mm -hmm. it was really intriguing. I learned a lot. Okay. That time. No, that's great. And, you know, like when you talk about angels, we'll get to our story, you know, because uh, you're one of those people that came into my life and, you know, kind of pushed me in the right direction when I first came out. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through uh, the rest of your story real quick. Um, so you said 15 years in, in the politics and government. Um, you know, you, you're already right bilingual probably because you, you know, born in Spain. So was that an easy, you know, um, uh, path for you to be, you know, with Mexico and kind of bridging that gap between American and Mexico, America and Mexico? It was. Uh, Spain and Mexico share a lot of commonalities. There's definitely some cultural differences. There's some, you know, colloquial differences. Think like UK and America. Like there's, it's obvious where somebody is from just by the way they speak and, and the type of words they use. Mm -hmm. But in terms of culture, in terms of the way to do business, I, I already was familiar with a lot of that. And um, I think in, in some way I'm, I'm sort of double privileged in that um, most people here don't guess me a foreigner. Uh, and when I go to Mexico, I'm always treated sort of this, with this weirdness because I, I look so strange compared to, you know, most people that speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, there are quite a few blonde, fair-skinned people that speak yes. Spanish, but we're a small minority and we're not, you know, usually prominent. Mm -hmm. so it was it was a very easy transition and, and uh, people in Mexico have always treated me re remarkably well. They, they've been, the hospitality there is, is second to none. And it was just really intriguing to learn how interlaced our countries are, despite all the political bullshit that happens and all the talk about immigration and all that mm -hmm. stuff it, at the end of it, it we couldn't survive without each other and and that's why the relationship on the, below the vitriolic level is very solid and very strong economically and and social culturally too and you're seeing that particularly in the southern border states in the united states you're seeing the the percentages of of hispanic people are increasing every year and um, i think california is already a majority hispanic population mm -hmm. texas is and so there is this integration of culture but yet every state um, i was lucky enough i got to travel quite a bit because of this job and i got to see the southern states um, of the united states but also the northern states of mexico and that was mm -hmm. fascinating just the contrast between just literally there's one border but on one side there's one reality on the other side there's a completely different reality yes. and understanding that and and um trying to change the narrative both here with folks that are scared to death to go to Mexico because they think there's some crazy civil war down there and down there to convince them that most Americans really like Mexican people. It's just the, the loud, obnoxious ones that, you know, spew hatred and, and, and racism. And, and But those are not, those don't speak for the American public at large. At least that's my 
perception of it. I think the majority of Americans understand that this is a country of, of many immigration, immigrant destinations. And, mm -hmm. and somehow, especially, I think that's one of the things I love most about Sacramento. We're the second most diverse city in the world. And we have 130 cultures living together and there's no, there's no issues. I mean, you know, there's, there's road rage and stuff like that, but that's usually not related to, to the country of origin. That's just because you're a bad driver. <laughs> <laughs> and you got rage. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so, all right. I got to hear this transition because you're in government. You're, you know, you're working with the U.S., with Mexico. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, there's this, these food trucks and I'm going to have this huge, you know, event in this park. Like, how did you get from... <laughs> How did you get from the government to <laughs> this food? Yeah, because it was I don't know, was it called Sacto Mofo Festival or was it just, you know, let's get these food trucks? Was it Fremont Park? I was really chefy back then, so I didn't even know to know about food trucks, but we'll get there later. What what was that first uh festival that you guys have? It's Fremont Park, correct? Correct, right, yeah. Okay. So there's a, a lead to that. Um, okay. Part of the things I've, I've been in this country for 20 some years now, um, but what I miss the most about Europe and particularly Spain is food as a social instrument rather than a, a, a nutritional instrument. Here, food is viewed as, as, as a practical item, not a social item. It's something you get in your car on your way to somewhere else. You, you barely even stop to think of how it tastes. You're just shoving it down your throat and, and so that you can get to wherever you were headed on time. In, in Europe, obviously these are broad generalizations, but in, in Europe, particularly the Mediterranean countries, food is the center of social happenings. It's, it's every Sunday, the families get together and they make big meals and the, the kids and the women and the men all like, you know, gather and, and the, the men talk smack about politics and soccer and the women gossip and the kids play and that's just that's what was my upbringing that was my Sundays during my upbringing and when I came here um, I remember when I lived in Miami I went to a friend's house and I knocked on his door during dinner time not on purpose I was just I think I was going to see if he wanted to hang out and he was having dinner with his family and his family asked me if I could come back a different time because they were having dinner and that didn't seem like a big deal to most people but to me that, that like that is so unheard of in the Mediterranean mm. culture because if you show up to somebody's house and, and you could, your face could be covered in spaghetti sauce and mm -hmm. there could be garlic bread still on your head. And, and if, if mom opens the door, you're sitting down and you're having a plate because you're yeah. clearly starving. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter what the actual reality is. You're, you, there's always extra food at any house in the yeah. Mediterranean. Here, that's definitely not the case. People are a lot more private about their, their, their dining time. And that really bothered me. So in the early 2000s, I started a group called Sacramento Epicureans. And um, what I loved the most about the city, it was also what I thought was most underrated. And that was the, the food diversity we have. Mm -hmm. But the food diversity here is, um, is, uh, is kind of hidden to the, the sanitized eye. Yeah. Um, if, if you're not adventurous, you're not gonna go down Stockton Boulevard and have a really good bowl of pho because mm -hmm. you're, you're gonna look at the news and think that you're gonna get you know, murdered, yeah. which is not, the case like you can easily go to every neighborhood in Sacramento it's nowhere near as bad as I've seen like you know uptown Miami and the, there's there's bad neighborhoods in this country but Sacramento doesn't have it to that level and so I, I kind of accidentally started doing these events for for folks and um, the group grew and it grew quickly and then eventually I got featured in the B and then it grew even more mm. and um, and so I, once a month I would set up a dinner in, in a hole in the wall mom and pop type place and I would set a fixed price. I would tell the owner of the restaurant, like, listen, this is your chance to shine. I'm going to bring you 30 to 50 people that have never eaten here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, make me a menu that's impressive. Um, and, and, and we're going to do it family style. And I'm going to pay you cash and just make sure you're ready for because there's going to be 30 to 50 people here. Mm -hmm. and, and I did that for a little over 10 years. And part of that process, a friend of mine who I worked with in government, he was just this fanatic about taco trucks. He just really, really loved them. And I, I always wondered because I, I saw him on the side of the road, the white trucks kind of nondescript with no mm -hmm. signage. And, and I, you see lines, but you, you know, if you're not a super adventurous person, you're not going to just get in a random line with a white van that mm -hmm. you just don't know. So I asked him if he could 
curate a tour of them for me. And, and so the idea would be to go to five or six different taco trucks and try the different, you know, products. And at the time, the tacos were a dollar a piece. So it was like a $30 tour of like six trucks. And you got to try like 15 tacos. And mm -hmm. I was so impressed with the quality of the food compared to the visual of the business because the visual of the business is terrible. Yes. Most of the time, those trucks are not clean. They, they have no marketing material whatsoever. You have to kind of guess um, or it's spray painted. And it, but then the <laughs> food comes out and it's just full of soul, full of like real real flavor and and i i started speaking to the owners of those trucks and i said you know i work at the capitol you guys could kill it with three tacos and a soda for four bucks are you kidding me mm -hmm. the state workers would be all over that and they they told me that um it wasn't allowed yeah I, I thought that was outrageous like that didn't make any sense i figured they were misinformed so i started poking around um the rules and sure enough the restaurant association had written the rules um, for food trucks in, in, in the downtown midtown sort of area. So needless to say, they were not friendly at all. And mm -hmm. as I poked at it, nobody really paid attention to me. I like, and obviously I was still pretty new in town. I didn't have um, the visibility that I've had over the last 10 years now. Um, so I started asking some of my government friends, like, what is this? How, how why, why is this like this? And they mm -hmm. said, well, this is what it is. And, and, and these are the rules and, and, and then somewhere along the way, I got in touch with um, Matt Geller, who runs uh, uh, sort of what I do, but in L.A. And he uh, is an attorney by trade, and he was suing every city that got in the way of food trucks. So I reached out to him and I said, you know, how did you tackle this? And he kind of gave me some ideas. And one of those ideas was to uh, create an event that would showcase that food trucks are a viable uh, addition to the food and beverage world, that they're not an alternative. They're not a they're they're one of the steps you know you start cooking whatever uh enchiladas in your kitchen selling to your friends eventually that becomes successful then you have a facebook page where you start selling it from and then you maybe start doing a farmer's market eventually a food truck and hopefully kind of following your progression you start opening brick and mortars and mm -hmm. and, and start making real money and so to me it was particularly with my background in international trade i was like why aren't we facilitating trade why are we getting in the way of it mm -hmm. this is this is offering people the capacity to live out their dreams to, if they have a good idea and a good business plan, you can really find success. Heck, you, you've demonstrated that better than most. And so, but you have to have that vision and you have to have the focus and, and hopefully not a million bumps in the road from government. Well, yeah. that started a four-year battle with the city of Sacramento and, and some of the more influential restaurants in Sacramento um, that did wanted no changes to that. And so part of my process in that was to um, pr produce this event and three friends and I decided to see if, if we brought like 12 trucks together, if people would show up. Now, I had never, I've done event planning, I've done corporate uh, event planning, I've done government event planning, but that's a very defined, very, you know, you know exactly how many people are coming, yep. you know, how much food to order. I had no idea if anybody <laughs> was going to show up and my, my ambitious estimate for that day was 500 people. I, okay. I just wanted 500 people for 12 trucks. That meant that everybody would do enough to, you know, to, to justify the day. And yeah. I, I will never forget. There's a number of moments in your life, you know, when your child is born, when, when you get married, the first time you see the Grand Canyon, the, mm -hmm. this is one of those days because it was 1145 for a noon start for that event. Okay. And I was standing on Fremont Park with all the trucks there, everything ready. And there was nobody there. And I had this like gut but feeling wait, of plus, failure. <laughs> plus, there wasn't enough wrap trucks in Sacramento, correct? Like correct. there was you you're bringing trucks in from out of town, correct? Most of them came from San Francisco. We had one come from like Fresno or something like that. Um, and then we had, I believe we had what was at the time called Mini Burger. I mm -hmm. think we had Chandos and or maybe that was right before Chandos. We had uh, Drewski was there, mm -hmm. um, Simply Southern. I don't know if you remember them. Yeah. Um, but the bulk of them were from out of town. And so mm -hmm. I felt even more responsible for, to make sure that we would do those folks, you know, properly because I didn't want them to drive all the way here and then fail. Mm -hmm. And so now it's 1145 and there's nobody at the park. And I'm, I'm just having an anxiety attack going, I failed. Like, I can't believe we had so much hype around it. We were on every TV channel, every radio station, everybody wanted to know about it and there was nobody there. Well, fast forward to one o'clock and that whole square was one sea of people. 
we completely jacked downtown Sacramento. We had over 10,000 people try to show up. Um, parking was impacted six blocks out all the way around. Every restaurant within a half a mile had two, three, four hour waits because people would show up and see these crazy lines and say, forget it. And ironically, several of the restaurants in the area were some of those that were so opposed to food trucks. And they ended up with a three hour plus wait for for, for that day. And, and at that point, a light bulb went off collectively in the city because the next Tuesday there was a city hall meeting and I went there and I said, well, I've, I've proven my point. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. We, people showed up and did they ever, and <laughs> are, are we, are we going to move forward? Oh yeah. And the mayor was very enthusiastic <laughs> and this is going to happen right away. And, and I, in my naive thinking, I, I left feeling victorious, thinking that this was the start of something great. Mm -hmm. um, that day was insane. That day I, I will never forget because people got in line and they didn't know where the line ended because the lines were two to three hours long wow. and trucks did not come prepared for that volume. I mean, how do you prepare 12 trucks for, for, for 10,000 <laughs> 10, people? Like, there is no, yeah, even I, can't even, I can't even think about that. <laughs> Even now, when we're three generations later of food trucks and, and we have veterans like you, that's that's a volume that's not achievable, right? So, no. um, but people did it and they stayed because they felt solidarity for the cause of the food trucks. And that was so heartwarming. I was so excited about that because I, I, I felt like, okay, this is a worthwhile mission. We need to pursue this. Mm -hmm. and so that started a combination of producing more of the large events mm -hmm. and starting to really heavily lobby the city and starting to, you know, basically tell them, listen, the, the state law clearly dictates that you can only regulate food trucks in the interest of public safety. Mm -hmm. A 30 minute parking limit has nothing to do with public safety has everything to do with competition. Mm -hmm. You don't get to decide if Burger King or McDonald's is successful. You have to give them the same odds. You have to give us the same odds mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. That was a long, um, unfun battle. I, I, yeah. I, did not enjoy those four years because every time we'd get really close and then everything would fall apart because some restaurant owner would lose their mind and, and everything would fall apart. And finally, we started sort of insinuating that if it didn't get resolved, we'd, we'd go to court. And the city attorney knew that they were in the wrong. And so at that point, things finally got accelerated. And um, after, like I said, four years, we came... Um, they came up with a package that addressed about 90% of our concerns. We didn't get some of the things that we wanted, like late night food is something mm -hmm. that I really, really wanted to facilitate. But the police department really did not like that idea. They were worried that food trucks would park in front of nightclubs and would start fights. And But I had just been in Austin. I saw how, how it, it was there and in Portland, Oregon. They, they totally make that work together. They have these mm -hmm. little food truck pods right close to yep. nightlife. And it's brilliant because it keeps people from driving. And it, but, you know, when you get 90% of what you're asking for, you can't get too um, greedy. You know, you have to accept, especially when the fight was, you know, um, two food truck owners, myself versus every major restaurant owner, <laughs> except for the Selen family and, mm -hmm. and the California Restaurant Association coming after us. We had no business winning that battle, but yeah. the, the law and fairness and common decency was on our side. And, and that, that was, that was a major biggest battle in that process of the four years, I started producing an event or two, because I noticed that that was the hardest part for most food trucks to find um, profitable locations that mm -hmm. were were also legal and where you couldn't get kicked out because somebody within a half a mile distance felt you you were threatening to them mm -hmm. so luckily i had a core of about six trucks that some of the og trucks that um, supported me and i for the longest time for a couple of years i did it just as a hobby mm -hmm. I, I wanted to help because i felt very strongly principled about this i wanted to see that the food truck market in sacramento could flourish and eventually it became a full-time job and mm -hmm. it was really difficult to do that while I was also doing my full-time government job, but those overlapped for five years. Um, oh, wow. And it, it really impacted sort of that work-life balance, you know, being from Europe, I always try to keep, keep somewhat of a balance there, but there was no balance. I was working 80 to hundred hours a week trying to, you know, get this business concept going, especially because there is no dummies guide on how to become Sacto Mofo. It's you're inventing <laughs> a whole new industry. Yeah. And, it, it was a sort of a situation that where I've probably had 50 different jobs in my life. I've done everything from taxes and accounting and um, um, 
God, what are some of the strange things? Car washing and uh, sailboat delivery to everything in food and beverage. And, and this job kind of brought all those things together because my government background taught me sort of the art of compromise. And, and, and also, I think one of the reasons we've stuck around is because from the very beginning, I partnered with elected officials. Mm -hmm. and I, I did that very, very much on purpose. A, mm -hmm. I wanted to validate what we did by making sure that um, um, that elected officials would see that food trucks were a viable alternative, that, they, that it was a, a positive thing. So we started doing these events in their, in their districts with them as the host and, and that helped um, pacify a lot of the vitriol that was being thrown out. And mm -hmm. really the core of the issues that the restaurant owners had were not realistic compared to Sacramento. And what I mean with that is if you look at LA and San Francisco, those are vertical cities. Those are cities that have lots of skyscrapers on top of each other, lots of volume of people in small amounts of space. So if you're a food truck operator, you're going to park wherever you park, you're going to park within a small distance from a restaurant because they're all on top of each other. Yeah. Both downtown LA, downtown San Francisco is like that. Sacramento is not like that. We we, we took we took the concept of a horizontal city to the max, mm -hmm. and, and we, we're super spread out. Mm -hmm. So here, if you park in front of a restaurant, you're kind of being a jerk. You, like there's no need for that. And yeah. behind the scenes, um, uh, a number of trucks um, helped make sure that we kept any kind of vitriol from escalating. So if there was a truck parking somewhere where they shouldn't, then one of the truck owners would call them and say, hey, knock that off. Let's let's yeah. make sure we don't reignite this this battle. And so we've been able to keep the peace to this day. I, we've had very minimal incidents with, with restaurants, uh, none that I can remember in the last four or five years. So it's um, ultimately my, my plan worked as I expected because I didn't think that we needed to be com combative with each other. There is yeah. a lot of isolated business parks and isolated government buildings that don't have food that don't impact a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, and then the combination of partnering with, with government officials, we, we started growing this, this company. And then five years ago, my boss got elected to Congress and um, I didn't want to go to DC and I got offered another job in government, but that was for a, a very demanding um, elected official that, that was known, still known as a workaholic. And so I knew that I can, I can do the work, but I, I wasn't sure that I could manage my company and work for someone that demanded 60 hours a week from me. So I, I did the scariest thing probably that I've ever done in my life. And then I, I quit for the first time in my life. I didn't have at least one stream of income I because I, I've always had two, three jobs. I, I, I grew up on welfare. I'm, I'm allergic to poverty. I, I will work five jobs if I have to, to make sure my rent and my food is on, you know, is taken care of. And so for the first time in my life, I didn't have that security blanket. And I remember that day vividly. It was scary. I, I went to the, the naked lounge on, on uh, by Fremont park. And I sat there at like eight 30, and I literally like watched the time go by past nine o'clock because for the first time in my life, I didn't have anywhere to show up. And it, the, the glee that I felt of being free lasted about 10, 15 minutes and then panic took over because I realized I had to make a living for myself <laughs> and I didn't know for sure if I was going to be successful with that. So, yeah. but I, I'm not, like I said earlier, the resiliency is strong in me and I, I decided, okay, if we're going to do this, let's go all out and, mm -hmm. and started you know doing just that and the rest is kind of history that the last yeah. five years we've seen phenomenal growth in, in the food truck and access to food trucks and um the the it's nowhere near a taboo subject anymore every major mm -hmm. corporation in the greater sacramento region has used food trucks um there's still a little bit of a generational split between older people and younger people in terms of like the roach coach concept mm -hmm. but my whole, whole goal all along was to a legalize food trucks b make it a, a place where trucks could flourish and see make sure that that there was acceptance of of it as a as an incubation mm -hmm. me mechanism for for folks because having a food truck is not the business that's not yeah. that should be a step to somewhere you can't settle yeah. with just a food truck it's a miserable lifestyle to just you know work one food truck and the money that you make off of that one food truck and then not have anywhere to go with it yeah. but 
as you've demonstrated, you can you can pivot and you can grow and you can grow exponentially. You're one of a handful of truck owners that have, have escalated your business into the higher leagues, and that's that's exactly what food trucks are. It's the purpose that they serve. They yeah. they're they're a great stepping stone, a great experimental uh, tool to see if your concept is solid, if it makes sense. And and we've seen, uh, thankfully, we've seen um, uh, a pretty lively food truck culture in Sacramento. Yeah. No, and I, you know, like I'll get back to what I was saying before. So when I first started and we talked about this before, like, and I think it was the first time you ever heard my side of the story. You, you were like, you got a white truck. Yeah. You got a few things on the side, but it's not eye catching. And I was like, my food to speak for itself. Like I was, <laughs> I was Cecil's taste. I was that guy straight out of the kitchen you know, nobody could tell me anything about my food, but it was great. And my food was good, but it wasn't food truck food. Like, and I, I, like I said, I told you this and you didn't even know, like, I was so pissed off at you because you're just like, yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, $300 isn't enough. I think it was like probably, you know, the most I made because I was doing the brewery circuit, just like, when everybody gets into the food truck, because everybody, when you first get a food truck and I got, I got mine in 2014 opened in 2015, but everybody says, Oh yeah. You know, you got to go to Sacto Mofo. I didn't know who Sacto Mofo was. Like I said, I was chefing. I wasn't, I was so tunnel vision, but when I got fired, I needed to figure out a, a different uh, direction in life. All, all I could do is cook. So I was like, all right, it's open my own restaurant is go be a chef for somebody. Uh, but people start ta- telling me about food trucks. And I, then I went to one, I went to the land park food truck mania. And I talked to, um, uh, barbecue wild. What, what was those guys name? The Smokers wild. Smokers wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And nicest dude. Um, and he, he pretty much told me, he was like, whatever you do, just don't do barbecue because it's not sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> no conflict of interest whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he said it was just so much work on the barbecue end. I was like, no, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about, um, I think at the time I wanted to do something like twisted tacos, but like Southern style food inside of a taco. But then I got on Culinary's truck and I saw how much volume he went through. And I was like, I'm doing burgers. Fuck it. I'm doing burgers. I'm going to have a little twist with my smoke, smoke pork belly, you know, but I was like the burgers away. Cause I, the only two food trucks that I ever been on before this, my buddy had one in Oakland. Um, I, I think it was called Opie's and then, um, Culinary. So both of those times I was like, Burgers, burgers is it. Um, but to get back to why I was so upset at you, because you just kept telling me you got to be McDonald's. You cannot, <laughs> you got to be eye catching. You got to be, and I was just so into like my chefism. And we went through, I, I think you kept me around, you know, you, you let me do, you know, events and stuff. But it was until I went to UC Davis. And I had pork belly and I had burgers and most of those people don't eat pork belly and burgers. <laughs> so, you know, like, I think you even told me, you're like, Cecil, you got to come up with something, man. Like again, $300 isn't cutting it because you got UC Davis on your ass about why is this truck out here? So I came up with this chicken sandwich and the rest is history. But I want to thank you, and I'm going to tell everybody, I already thank you on the side, but thank you for just staying on top of me about not letting me rest on just being a chef. Think of it as a business. Think of it as you want to be McDonald's. What does McDonald's do? They do everything consistent, and they get the food out fast. And that's what you told me. And I would not, Nash and Proper would not be here if I didn't have that Paul Summerhausen in my back of my mind while I was sitting here trying to make it to that other side. 
because I, I believe you saw something in me because you could have not booked me for shit, Paul. You could have <laughs> been like, this dude, you know, like he don't listen. He's just out here making 300 bucks. But thank you so much for just being that voice and always believing in me for, you know, the two, three years that I was just, I had to be the lowest person on the books for you. You weren't. That was, you're hard on yourself, which is, you know, typical for you. But the, the, the talent in you, the promise in you was evident from the beginning. And and you're part of a, a, a strange breed of humans that, that, you know, call themselves chef. And um, they're a challenging group of humans to do business with because a chef is, is genetically an artist. Mm -hmm. And an artist usually, and I'm painting with broad strokes here, but usually an artist doesn't understand or want to understand or compromise their art for the sake of commerce they, they mm -hmm. want to stay true to, to you know their vision because their vision in their mind is brilliant and yeah. you need to have that that mindset because otherwise why else would you be a chef it's a miserable freaking career like you get paid shit you work in the worst circumstances you get yelled at by the owners by the servers by it's it's you have to love what you do you have yes. to have this passion for it mm -hmm. if you don't you're you're gonna end up depressed and alcoholic and not not successful and you were you've always been really humble which is which is another thing that you don't often see with chefs and and that I was just always really impressed with you and I I just hope that if I just kept poking at you that you were you were thinking small that mm -hmm. you would you would eventually you know get that there was a bigger plan for you and mm -hmm. when when I say McDonald's I know a lot of people have like this misconception or, or this like disdain towards them but there's literally not a single food business in the world that has been as successful as McDonald's so you can detach yourself from the culinary aspect of McDonald's but still admire what they've achieved um, as, as, as an entity and the fact mm -hmm. that they can copy and paste their business concept all around the globe and still be successful. Mm -hmm. But when I look at McDonald's, they do it perfect. Every, the, the imagery, the, the experience, the service experience, the, the consistency and outfits and logos, everything is, is, there's been hundreds of millions of dollars in research done on their end for that. So why not borrow that mm -hmm. and, and help, you know, the small person be successful with that. And mm -hmm. I've tried to model that in how we run our business in the, in that, you know, be loud, be proud, throw mm -hmm. your brand out there and make sure that people know who you are. That's why our colors are bright and, and, and festive. And that's why I'm, 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 I'm like a broken record with any truck that doesn't have a good wrap. Like you're literally, I have seen the evolution of trucks going from shitty wraps to good wraps. And it's literally a 30% income difference. Yep. And you, I'm, I'm sure you can attest to that too. The food is the same. You may you make amazing food. It doesn't matter though. It, people, we've had a number of trucks through the years that have come and gone. And these were also professional chefs that were really skilled and yet they couldn't sell their food because they, they, they did not understand the marketing aspect of it. They, they, just a, a clean, approachable look to their business is, is critical. And, yeah. and as a matter of fact, McDonald's has proven that if you have just average food, but as long as you make it look fantastic because the food that you get in the box never looks like the picture that you saw in the drive through but it doesn't matter at that point you're already sold and you're hungry you're salivating you're going to eat that quarter pounder with you know with happiness yes. that's that if they can do it with mediocre food imagine if you actually make good food how successful you can be yep. so for me they're sort of like my gospel if you will when it comes to commerce because if if you can make yourself visible and, and be consistent and being able to produce a, a, an, a, an item that people get excited about. And particularly with the consumer, they have very weird behaviors, as you know, like the 80% of consumers will always order the same thing every single time. You want to make sure that that thing that they're going to order is, is exactly as brilliant as the last time. Mm -hmm. And because if they, if you disappoint them once, they may give you one more try, but the, the, the average consumer is very fickle. You disappoint them two times in a row, you lost them. And it takes all this effort to get them into your door. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure we keep them. And, and that's the consistency aspect of it. And that's something that I, over the years, I, number one, two, and three fights are always with chefs because chefs feel like they're being held back artistically when I tell them pick a small menu mm -hmm. and stick to it 
You can't, you can't do, you're not a celebrity chef yet. You can't do this menu that changes every three days. Yeah. Because if I just have the best pork belly burger on Monday and I see you in my area a week later on Tuesday, I come and say, hey, give me that burger. And you're like, oh no, today I did this tofu soup. It's amazing. I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> yeah. and, and now not only am I not like coming back, I'm also going to write a negative review saying this jerk like did a bait and switch on me. Uh -huh. so it's so critical to like give people consistency. And that's a lot of the root of where, where my, my stubborn um, um, uh, stalking comes from when it, when it came to you, it just, you know, look at the big picture. Lynn, you're one of the very few chefs that I know that has been able to look at the big picture. It, it it's, it, there's a humbling component to that. And I admire that in you. It, it's not easy for someone to look in the mirror and say, what I'm doing now is not working and I need yeah. to change that. That's, it's really difficult. Most businesses don't do that and they fail and go out of business. Yeah. You, you did that in a massive way. You didn't just, you didn't just change a, a wrap. You changed everything. You, and yeah. then you did what <laughs> nobody else does other than Krispy Kreme. You threw everything on one, in one item and it blew up. You took some massive gambles and it paid off. So the, I have a tremendous uh, professional and personal respect for you for, for the courage to, to do what you did and, and, and the, the, the insanity, the masochism that it took to, to pull off what you did <laughs> and to be this successful so quickly is, is awesome. and just really inspiring. Cause you know, as you know, the last two years have been really difficult in our industry. And, and mm -hmm. so it's, I, I hold on to your story and to stories like yours to, to keep me on the positive end of, of, of the mental health, because uh, if you focus on all the, negativity that's happening right now it's it's easy to just go down that rabbit hole but i keep looking at the victories and 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 i use those as inspiration and i try to use that as a hopefully to inspire others like you that are are still sort of on the fence um and are not sure if it's worth becoming a professional food truck or not mm -hmm. yeah and it's it's a tough it's a big gamble you know like it was the biggest gamble i to go home and tell your wife you know like hey I, I'm just going to switch my whole, because I still had Cecil's taste. I was, I was straddling, but I, my mental health was deteriorating, you know, like I was just, I, I, I was still smoking my pork belly. I was still doing the burgers and I had this whole chicken truck or trailer over here, just doing massive numbers, but I still had one foot over here in Cecil's taste because that was my baby. And that's what I told everybody. They're like, you're going to do both. And I was like, that's my baby. I don't want Cecil's taste to go away. But when you, when I look back at it, Cecil's taste birthed Nash and proper. So it's always going to be there, you know? And that's the, that's what clicked in my head is like, this is something I don't know what it is, but plus it's just chicken. I'm not switching. Just like you said, I was, I was always with specials. I always had my pork belly. I always had my burgers, but then I always had these specials going just to get my creative juices going. So I was really in a place where I was like, I didn't want to give it up, but I had to. And like you said, some people go down with the ship. I could have went down with ceaseless taste and we wouldn't have ever been having this conversation because I'll be back working 80, hundred hours in the goddamn kitchen, you know? Yeah. And you know, like, or a Cisco rep. Not to, I know I got a lot of chef friends that are Cisco reps. I'm not bashing you. I'm just saying, <laughs> just you not know, a like that's, you. that's kind of where things go when you get, mm -hmm. you know, when you don't feel like you want to work in a kitchen anymore, but, um, all right. I want to play a few games with you, Paul. Are you ready for a few games? Sure. All right. I want to know the top five food truck trends that you've seen. And I know there's been a lot <laughs> uh, during your last, how many years you've been doing this Paul? 10 years now? Yeah. 10 years. Yeah. So what are some of those trends? Um, that's a good question. I, I Sacramento in, in that way kind of unpleasantly surprised me. I, I, I expected that we would end up like San Francisco with, uh, 50 different shades of culinary experiments and here uh, folks are pretty conservative about their palate they, they like burgers as you well pointed out they love yeah. their burgers that's number one by far barbecue is a close second and then mexican food is is a close third mm -hmm. uh, everything else is much riskier um, mm -hmm. and particularly as you delve out into the 
more ethnic foods, th those are even harder. And then when you start experimenting and you start doing, you know, like what you were suggesting, Southern food inside taco shells, that's almost doomed to fail here because people don't think outside the box when it comes to their food, which I, I was really surprised by because we are such a diverse community. Yeah. But, you know, you have to give the consumers what they want. And, and so I, I, I tend to push people in that direction because ultimately, if you're going to go in business, unless you have a trust fund or, or, or you won the lottery, you, you want to make money and you want to be successful. And mm -hmm. if you want to be successful, you're going to, you know, tofu soup is not going to do it. So you, <laughs> you, you better make a mean, a mean something that's in the, one of those three groups and, and, and be successful. As far as like food, like trends, the biggest one obviously is the one that you started with, with the hot chicken. Um, but I, I don't remember many, um, the food truck industry ha hasn't really had the luxury of, we don't have the volume of food trucks in the Sacramento region to see clear trends mm -hmm. in that way. But the, the, if there are trends, it's the burgers, barbecue, Mexican yeah. sort of food that seems to take 80% of the business. And mm -hmm. then, um, everybody else comes, comes behind that. So it's, um, yeah. I would, that would be my modified answer. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, like you got Drewski with the grilled cheese. He's been doing, you know, like just a solid menu for I don't even know how many years he's been doing. 10 years, it. too. Yeah, 10 years. Yeah, he started with you, right? Mm -hmm. It was, uh, you know, I think Crush Burger was already out. But uh, what was it called? Mini Burgers. Well, I don't or think mini it was burger. Crush Burger yet. And then they switched, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, and uh, Joe's a really good friend of both of ours. Um, so, um who, who's come? Who's five dead or alive people coming to Paul's dinner party? Wow, that's a good question. Because um, you're a good conversation, so I'm sure this could go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, this this would go different directions. I, the first one that came into mind, just because I'm a huge soccer fan, being born and raised in Spain, and particularly around Barcelona, um, that. I don't know that there is a equivalent. Michael Jordan of soccer is, is Lionel Messi. Mm. And I, I've, I've grown up with him. He's, he's been playing soccer for 20 years and he's literally the most talented soccer player that's ever lived. And, mm -hmm. um, he, but he's also very quiet and humble. It's like, you know, there's, I've always admired people that can be great and humble. It's hard to do that. A lot of people that are great, let everybody know. Yep. <laughs> um, so he would definitely be one of them because I, I have a thousand questions. Um, and then the other avenues probably would go into politics. There'd probably be some, some politicians. I mean, can you imagine having dinner with Bill Clinton? That, <laughs> that would be amazing. Like the stories. <laughs> nice. An off the record dinner with Bill Clinton. Would be yeah. <laughs> on a personal and a geopolitical level would be fascinating. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and then same with like someone like Elvis Presley. Can you imagine oh, like the transition, like the cultural transition that he helped facilitate? The, the, one of the first people sort of in this country that that got two groups of people that historically were not together mm -hmm. um, by blending blending cultures that was, was was you know a lot of people would think is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. and, and so th th there's so many interesting people in history that it's it's. It's hard to narrow it. I've never actually thought about that. Part of it is because, you know, it's, it's um, there, that would have to be a musician uh, in there. I imagine someone like Prince, the, 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 just the, the life he led and the brain he had. He was so talented and played nine instruments and, mm -hmm. and just so what a brain to, yes. you know, when it comes to like being able to talk to an artist, whether it's a chef or a musician, so when you see that passion, that's always been my biggest driver in life. Like when I see, I don't care if stamp collecting or, or, or you have a collection of snails, like whatever it is that underwater basket weaving, whatever makes your like heart go fast. If, if you speak to someone like that, it's so cool to see that, that, that spark in their eyes, that, that, you know, that, that excitement around them. Um, and I've, I've always, I've been lucky enough that I've traveled a fair amount. I've been to about 30 countries. I've seen, oh, wow. but 40 of the United States and uh, part of my biggest hobby is usually approaching strangers and, and places I go to and just sit down with them and talk to them and or you know if you're lucky enough to share a meal with them and ask them like what is what what's your life like how does it you know and, and you end up like getting invited to their house you end up getting these like cultural experiences that you normally don't get as a tourist mm -hmm. and that's always that's been that's by far my number one passion in life just to understand and, and broaden my um 
get a better understanding of different cultures, different ways of living life and mm -hmm. uh, understanding what triggers different people for how, how does passion translate to different people? Because, you know, some people are, uh, you know, you have the John McEnroe's in life where passion is carried very outwardly. And then you have people <laughs> like you where, where it's, you kind of have to drag it out and you mm -hmm. have to get, get, get a conversation started before the voice like raises and before the eyes light up. It, it takes a little minute. It's, yeah. it's a little, little slower warm up. Mm -hmm. But once you get there, once you get to the, the person's sweet spot and, and they start talking about what they're really passionate about, it's, it's fascinating. Even mm -hmm. if I don't necessarily have to agree with it, but just to understand like what makes you, what makes you get up at, you know, five in the morning to do what you do. That's, I find that amazing. Yep. All right. Um, so we're, we're getting close to the end here. Um, uh, what was, uh, so when we're at the end, I think I told you we, we come in hot at the end. Um, so it's any topic that you want. It could be funny. It could be political. It could be about food truck trends. But um, Paul Summerhausen, it is time to come in hot. What you got, Paul? I, I wanted to thank you for what you said earlier. That was really cool. I, I, I got chills when you shared that. I, I, as you know, until three or four weeks ago, I had no idea that that was part of your narrative. And I just thought I was like this, you know, bully that kept, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kept harassing you to, to put a proper rap on your track and to expand your menu. But I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled and stoked about that. I, I, you know, ultimately, particularly as you get older, you start thinking about legacy and what, what you, are you leaving the world better than you found it? And um, it's nice to know that um, in, 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 in a small way, I was, I was able to be part of your puzzle and, and to part of your growth. And that's something I'm super stoked about. That's, that's, it's, it's a lot of entrepreneurship is, you know, there's a hundred occurrences and 80 of them are shit. And 20 of them are, you know, victories. So when you get those victories, you, you got to embrace them. You got to, you got to savor them and, 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 and marinate in them because they won't last long. And if you get too comfortable in them, then you're going to have a rude awakening. Yeah. So, it, and particularly over the last 18 months, it's been, um, you know, even more challenging than usual mm -hmm. as everything shifts and all the pieces move. So it's, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm stoked to have someone like you in my life that inspires me, that shows me that, um, you know, change and, and, and resilience is, is, is there despite the quiet front that you put up and, and that you're, you're, I finally have a chef example that I can talk about that actually did shift and that found a way to be commercially viable and, and successful and despite the trends in our industry and, and that, um, and it's, I use you as an example, I teach classes and, and I talk to new truck owners and I tell them like, you know, he should be a role model for you. He should be, you know, understand, you know, be real with yourself enough that you understand your shortcomings. Yeah. I think that's the hardest part for anybody that's self-employed, understanding where your weak spots are so you can find people to compliment that. That's hard though, because it, it, in a way, I think a lot of us interpret that as weakness and it's not, it's strength. If mm -hmm. you identify where you're least effective and you don't address that, then you're going to continue to be least effective. Yep. And, and yet, if you can find like you have um, people around you that, that build you up, that lift you up, that make you stronger, that you have a fantastic wife that does the same mm -hmm. and keeps you focused. When you have that team around you and you're able to humble yourself in a way to understand when a challenge is bigger than you and that you need help, that's the, I think that's the big difference between successful and unsuccessful entrepreneurs. When, when you can understand that you can only grow to a certain point by yourself. Mm -hmm. If you're comfortable there, then by all means, stay small. Mm -hmm. But why? If we're going to go through what we go through as business owners, why not think big? Why not try to make the most of it? Why not take some risks and see what happens? Because, you know, sometimes we have the choice to do that. Sometimes life throws us these curveballs where we have no choice but to take the risks like yeah. we, we, we have been over the last uh, year and a half. So when you have the, the opportunity to build on a dream than, than you should. And, and yep. particularly if you have a team around you of people that are going to lift you and, and, and help you in that. So it's, it's, you're, you're an inspiring person in my life. You, you've, you've accomplished incredible things and you're only getting started. And um, you're a great um, example for other truck owners to, to look up to. And, and I, I, I look forward to seeing what the, all the other chapters of the future hold for you. Thank you, Paul. Plug all your Sacto Mofo stuff. 
Well, at this point, we, um, we've kind of remodeled everything we did. We've come up with all these new markets because mm -hmm. of COVID, because all the conventional stuff didn't work. So a lot of, um, uh, if, if, if we're in your area, you're going to find us on, on our websites, actomofo.com. That's where all our events are. And um, what we're seeing a lot of right now is catering. A lot of folks are trying yep. to do sort of safe outdoor catering. And that we're getting um, a lot of inquiries for, for those type of events. And I think we have another two months or so before the weather starts turning. So if, if folks are interested in celebrating some type of um, whatever, something special in their life, then a food truck is a pretty healthy um, and safe alternative right now to be able yeah. to do it outdoors. So that's that's been kind of the, the song of the food truck people. Cool. And, um, you know, any of those food truck, you know, either they want to start a food truck, I always tell them the uh, at Chef Cease is getting my DMs. I answer all kinds of questions all day. You know, that's cool. like, I appreciate yeah. that. and that's, um, you know, I tell everybody just, just DM me. I'll, I'll answer, you know, don't go to Nash and proper though. Cause Nash and proper <laughs> DMS are lit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for, for coming in hot, I'm chef cease subscribe anywhere that you listen to your podcast. Uh, if you want some of those delicious mouth watering, hot chicken sandwiches, go to at Nash and proper at nationproper.eg, www.nationproper. And like I said, if you need to holler at me directly, at Chef C's. Thanks to Paul. I'll holler at you later, man. We got to get out of here. Cheers. Peace. Hey, that was great, Paul. Thanks, man. That was cool. Thanks again for sharing that. That just literally gave me chills.